And now we are gonna go ahead. Yes. Your attention, please. And I might turn the lights down. Yeah, I'm going to have a chance to eat Okay. <laughs> Uh, I am now so happy that there are cupcakes along with this class. Um, <laughs> I should have, uh, <laughs> I would have added it to the flyer. <laughs> um, so as Faresha mentioned, um, it's my birthday this week. I am actually doing like fun events every day of the week. This is the fun event that I'm doing today, uh, <laughs> which feels like a personal reckoning, like turning 30 is a bit of a uh, a moment um, and I'm really excited uh, and honored to uh, be able to share all of this research that I've done over the years and kind of put something um, in a tangible way that can be like a mushroom spore moment, you know, where you can kind of receive some of the, uh, um, some of the inspiration from this research and carry it into your own practice. Um, I would say that the particular ecosystem niche of what, what this art practice is, is like um, on the cutting edge of what art is becoming right now in terms of eco art. Um, and you will see that as we evolve through this conversation. So um, we'll just start. Um, so the presentation is titled Artists as Urban Alchemist, Ecological Restoration and Community Building Through Public Art. Um, the term urban alchemist is a term that I borrowed from uh, Mindy Fulila, who talks about uh, repairing um, the harms of segregation in, in urban planning. Um, but I am also using this term to talk about ecological restoration um, because that is, uh, something that I'm very passionate about in public art um, as a scholar and uh, as a budding artist in this particular field. So um, I'm, we're gonna do this presentation in a very unique way. So as you can see, there's like an entire mind map. <laughs> so I tried to make a, a slides presentation and it was just taking too long and uh, things that were connected didn't seem to be as connected um, in that format. So in this way, everything that is connected is clearly connected and uh, it's a resource because uh, I mostly put links to everything. <laughs> Um, and so you can go back and click through these links as part of your own um, research. So it's both a presentation and an archive um, and an incredible sense-making tool. I highly recommend it. It's with Miro and it's the mind map function. So uh, today we're gonna go through three different sections. Um, the first section is a reckoning of traditional public art and in uh, and inspiring alternative case studies. I always like to lead with like, how can we learn from this um, and take inspiration and bring it into our work? So that's, I think the most important and that's what we're gonna do first. Um, the second, the conceptual building blocks. I'm gonna be going through a series of essays that I've written um, and, and tease out some important concepts that I think will help build um, an understanding of these practices and these works. And then I'll talk uh, a little bit about my meandering trajectory uh, near the end um, because I'm, I'm human and I'm making, you know, making sense of my practice. Again, I'm just 30 years old. Um, if I was, you know, doing a retrospective at like 65, things might be more coherent, um, but uh, we're at this particular benchmark um, in my research practice. Uh, so uh, before we move into um, the case studies, uh, I want to share this incredible uh, quote from Lauren Bond of Mod Metabolic Studio. Um, she says, artists need to create on the same scale that society has the capacity to destroy. And then she created a whole neon billboard about it. Um, Lauren's work with Metabolic Studio includes bending the LA River, like the Los Angeles River, <laughs> that has been um, heavily... Um, controlled um, in a series of like canals and dams um, to the point that it, it's it's not really like a river that's flowing naturally. So she managed to get these permits and an unbelievable crazy story of how she got these permits um, 
to redirect the water flow from these like contained sections of the river and bend them into a public park um, to restore the natural watershed of the area so that the water could um, actually re return to reaching the native habitat, the native plants, the animals, um, and, and also do a kind of like water filtration system. Um, yeah. and uh, replenish their wells. So it's a kind of like landscape architecture meets land art meets poetry, um, yeah. kind of an artwork. And it's the kind of uh, work that I'm fascinated by. Um, and we're gonna see a lot more of these. So uh, in this idea of the artist as an urban alchemist, as an activist, um, we're gonna go and think more about public art. Um, and we're gonna think about public art uh, first with something very familiar, which is metal sculptures and art as, a, as an adornment. So one of my um, earliest art experiences in Miami was actually walking around the FIU campus and taking photos with the public art sculptures all over. Um, I did that in like my 10th grade high school class. Um, mm -hmm. And I remember feeling like, but oh, these are so cool. Look at all of these minimalist apart pieces. So we're actually gonna look at them um, through their website um, because I found that they were- uh, <laughs> They were all taken down? No, that was upstairs. Did you rotate the exhibits of the public art on campus? Because we have a lot of different pieces that have been collected over the years, and then they're not always permanent. Like they get taken down and something else comes in their place. Mm -hmm. Yes. So, uh, and this is pretty normal of like public art collections. But as you can see, when, when FIU thinks about public art, they are mostly outdoor sculptures. And the reason they are outdoor sculptures, um, who are mostly either made of metal or some kind of like long lasting uh, combination of like metal or ceramic or something um, is because these kinds of works um, have very little maintenance required. Mm -hmm. So often public art um, is commissioned with uh, a minimal maintenance budget. Um, and they're also commissioned with a predictable production budget and timeline because an artist is seen as like a producer of an object, the same way that like uh, a factory produces a product. Mm -hmm. So this is Miami-Dade County's uh, Art in Public Places portfolio. Uh, this is an excellent department. Um, it was established in 1973. And what's cool about it is that 1.5% of construction costs of new county buildings um, across Miami-Dade County gets allotted to the budget of art in public places. Um, and they do quite a lot with it. Um, they have these beautiful installations with the Adrian Arch Center um, inside and outside of the space. Um, they have some great murals around town. So one of the things that they uh, highlight is that they deliver great works of art on time and on budget. <laughs> Which I think is just very, realistic uh, <laughs> um, and because the reality is as an artist uh, who's working at very large scale collaborating with institutions like airports or uh, performing arts centers and you're you know responsible for delivering on time and on budget uh, there's very little room for risk and experimentation um, and it creates certain parameters that keep uh, what pub we understand as public art as what we see here, and this is at the airport, by the way. I mean, these are um, really gorgeous pieces by uh, Michelle Okadonner, um, inspired by our natural, our natural marine life um, ecosystems. They're, they're lovely pieces, but they're primarily art as decoration. And even if they're talking about like ecological restoration, the actual material that they're made of, you know, is, is like extractive metallic material. Um, so, these um, insights that we're, you know, we're getting from like, okay, this campus sees public art in this particular way. And the Miami-Dade County's, um, well, you know, budget and uh, project timeline see art, uh, public art in a particular way. 
why does it have to be this way? You know, um, can there be space for sport to look differently? So this is where I, I kind of point to the idea of, of lack of, of imagination uh, on the power of art. The art is supposed to be a question. Art is supposed to be decorative. Uh, it's not supposed to solve anything. Um, but in fact, <laughs> there's a whole world now. <laughs> um, uh, and this is the question that I'm asking and, and, and many people in this um, emerging world of like land art as um, uh, environmental restoration and social healing are, are asking, which is what if instead we build the funding of large scale public art as a tool for creative problem solving that leads to environmental and social healing? So uh, this question is related to my work, which I call environmental art social practice. And we're gonna dive deeper into that later on. Um, but essentially I came up with this um, term as one to use for my life because I was going through a, a road trip across California, uh, visiting different eco communities there when I was doing my permaculture design certification. So it's like literally learning how to um, work with agriculture in order to create more um, fertile ecosystems and ways of living with the earth. And I ran into this MFA program at UC Santa Cruz um, and they were, it was like MFA and environmental art and social practice. So then I had a lot of fun with the links on their website for a while <laughs> and then grew and, and lived and, and did many things. And uh, I didn't attend their program. Uh, I thought an MFA directly with the school um, was going to be a bit out of budget for me. Um, but instead, I wrote an art thesis, um, which we're going to review later. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and that was part of a bigger arc of uh, creating an alternative MFA, um, which is a different way of approaching your education by creating your own certifications and creating a patchwork um, of following the different threads in your life and then still writing a thesis and creating a project at the end. Mm -hmm. It sounds cool. Not every institution considers it an MFA, <laughs> um, but, it, it, but I give myself credit for it. So um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, so these case studies for dreaming bigger are part of um, uh, of research I've done around this uh, idea of like what if these large scale public art projects actually were solutions, um, and uh, all of the projects here are um, aspects of solutions, whether they're heavy on ecological restoration or community building or both. Um, and we're going to start with um, Agnes Dennis. Has anyone here heard of Agnes Dennis? <laughs> there was one nod. <laughs> yes. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh-huh. So, uh, so this piece, um, it's called Wheatfields. Um, <laughs> she essentially got uh, permission to uh, take over like an acre um, right in front of the Twin Towers um, in the summer of 1982. And she decided to plant wheat. And not only to plant wheat all by herself, but to turn it into like a community volunteering like project where lots of people were showing up in downtown New York in the financial district to like grow wheat um, right in front of the Twin Towers and World Trade Center, which, you know, we're like the centers of finance in the world and contrasting that with um, the, the humble and deep relationship uh, America has to the heartland and to wheat. So it was a good, again, a deeply poetic project. It had a lot of um, community engagement, and it was uh, one of the uh, kind of first land art pieces to um, to have a restorative quality, right? So like that dead earth um, in the financial district uh, got repurposed to grow something incredibly healthy and fertile and symbolic um, like wheat. Um, I love that piece. Um, and I think Tree Mountain takes the potential of that piece and exponentially uh, transforms it. So this is a project that Agnes Dennis did in Finland where she uh, did, a, essentially it's, she reforested a mountain, but she, she reforested a mountain in a mathematical shape so that it's like a, a spiral going upwards towards the top. And, um, I believe that there's a lease on this uh, project for 400 years. So none of those trees can be touched 
for 400 years. Uh, it's pretty impressive. I mean, we, we're often here about like tree planting as um, one of the easiest ways to offset carbon and to support ecological restoration. Um, it's pretty impressive to see a government support a, a project at this scale. Um, so in total, it was like 11,000 trees, 11,000 uh, 11, people. So each person was planting a tree. Um, the, the plantings happened from 1992 to 96. And then I think these photos are from the early 2000s at the bottom. Um, so this is an interesting way of taking something that is like, we're going to plant a forest, which is something that maybe, you know, you can think of um, belonging in landscape design and turning it into art because it's following a different principle, it's how it's being done. So there's a there's a gesture that she's doing that's turning something that isn't that wouldn't necessarily be considered art into land art. And I want you to um, definitely pay attention to that because a lot of this territory of land art is, is about those like, <laughs> yes, it's ecological restoration using a lot of landscape design, but there's a, a, a touch to it. Um, on a much smaller scale, she has this piece called the living pyramid. Ooh living pyramid. Um, this was installed in Socrates Sculpture Park, and this is actually how I found out about Agnes Dennis. Um, she uh, just created this beautiful sculpture that um, we've seen many different kinds of like uh, vertical gardens. She again was using a mathematical uh, formula to create the design, and then in each row there were different native plants and flowers being made, so it's a living sculpture. Um, I think this is a really great way to integrate um, sculpture and um, and engaging ecology. Uh, since these kinds of projects have become a lot more uh, popular, if you visit Lincoln Road um, in any of the coming weeks, they have an Atala butterfly but project right now. Mm -hmm. So it's these like uh, portable metal sculptures that have lots of plants all around. And some of the plants um, uh, are pollinator plants and specifically the kunti plant, uh, which is the only plant that the Atala butterfly um, will lay its eggs on. Uh, and the Atala, of course, is like endangered and it's a very important butterfly to the South Florida ecosystem. So there's there's a lot of people running with this idea. And as, as you see these uh, kinds of pieces, I want you to not only see like, oh, this is a piece, but if you can like abstract the logic mm -hmm. behind it, right? Like this isn't just a pyramid. It's like, this is a sculpture that houses plants. You can make a sculpture that houses plants that gets installed in a public space, right? There's, they're not um, always inaccessible. Um, and I try to always remind myself when I see these <laughs> kinds of projects, it's like, how can I apply that logic myself? Um, so Agnes was definitely the first artist who um, introduced me to this kind of work, but my current favorites are Mary O'Brien and um, Daniel McCormick. So these two um, are really fascinating. Um, they are a husband wife duo. Um, and they do reme land remediation projects, which I, I would call them ecological restoration. And they work a lot with watersheds. So this piece that you're seeing here, um, it's a River Fork Ranch floodplain. So the sculpture is actually this shape. Um, it was made uh, with a lot of community help. Of course, they needed lots of permits to do it. But the, um, the result of creating these shapes, um, which are not primarily about the shapes, but primarily about how it's shifting the movement of the water, is um, actually supporting um, the ecology of the river, the flow of the river, and restoring natural habitats that have been worn away because of like loss of key species like beavers, for example. So structures like this will help bring back some of those um, creatures. And you're welcome to read more about it. They do different versions of it across different watersheds. Um, and my absolute favorite project um, right now is uh, the, um, the Oyster Reef. Um, so this photo is from San Francisco Bay. Um, the artists, again, got permits um, and a lot of support from engineers to clean up the gunk coming from the pipes um, of San Francisco Bay. And uh, the pipes had like kind of a clay silt. So they 
gathered that clay silt material and put it in molds to create these kinds of shapes. These shapes were installed into the San Francisco Bay and the shapes themselves, uh, which are made out of this material that's like cleaning up the bay, um, are also made to host oysters. And um, I don't know if you know about the oyster projects, but oysters clean water. Um, that's one of their incredible ecosystem services. So this is essentially a public art sculpture that like, you know, somebody visiting San Francisco Bay will be like, oh, cool public art sculpture snap, read about the, the, um, the little blurb that they might have right in front of it. But it actually helps to clean the bay by cleaning the pipes from the city mm -hmm. infrastructure. And it's supporting uh, research and into oysters as a source of uh, bioremediation and water purification. Like, why can't all artworks do that? <laughs> like, admittedly, probably like, I would be curious to, to learn more about this project and see like, what was their timeline? Like who let them take these money risks? Um, how did they get those permits? Um, but it's really, really exciting to see something like that. Wait, what is the material for that? It's a, like a clay silt from the pipes. And you can uh, feel free to read more about it. Um, it was already in the bay. Uh, so what we take out of the bay, we put back in the bay. So it's a residue, it's like a natural clay residue from like the, um, from the, I think the things that end up making it to the pipes from water runoff. Yeah. Uh, there is a place where they have a, a specific name for the material, but I just, in my head, uh, put it as uh, like clay and silt. Um, but good question. So the next artist is uh, Betsy Damon. So pretty much everyone in my, in like, the art world in New York right now <laughs> is really into Betsy Damon. Um, she's having a moment because she's having a retrospective and uh, she also wrote a book called, um, uh, it, it's heavily focused on water. She's actually written multiple books on water and she's very much like the eco-spirituality of water lady in the art world. <laughs> um, so she created a piece in 1988 in China called The Living Water Garden. Um, so this park that you see here is a work of art, like in, it is called Living Water Garden. Um, she of course didn't do it herself. Uh, she was working with many engineers and landscape architects and the Chinese government. Um, again, how do these artists network themselves to do this? <laughs> um, but uh, the idea is that the park is uh, diverting polluted water from the rivers into a wetland filtration system from which it emerges clean enough to drink. And I think you can even see that a little bit in the coloration of the photo. The other cool thing about this project is that there's a lot of community involvement. I mean, it's a public park, right? So people get to use it, but then people also got to you know, volunteer in the process of making it and get engaged in lots of different kinds of community activities. So it was both healing the, the water source by, you know, um, cleaning up the polluted water through uh, natural system services from the plants, but also creating community and a healthier lifestyle around it uh, by creating this culture shift. And this is the project, by the way, that um, inspired and influenced um, the metabolic studio piece I mentioned earlier about bending the LA river. It's very similar what they're trying to do, but one got done in China in 1998. Now one is being done now, which is 2024 in Los Angeles. Um, so you can also kind of see the, the timelines or some of these things take a while to, to reach. <laughs> um, the next artist I want to share with you um, is Aviva Ramani. And her she has a really interesting piece called Blue Trees, which is similar to Tree Mountain by Agnes Dennis in that um, they're using copyright law and intellectual property pr protection in order to protect an ecosystem, right? So you can't cut down any of the trees in Tree Mountain because it's an artwork. So she tried the same idea um, by using a special dye that won't damage the trees to paint a series of trees. 
Um, so the piece is called um, Blue Trees and sometimes it's called Blue Trees Symphony. Uh, let's see if the photos will load in this one. Oh no. Oh, there we have, we have, we have a video. Um, so essentially uh, they're applying this blue paint um, to the trees to create these like large scale paintings. By painting trees, they're saying like these trees are now works of art. So if a pipeline is trying to be built through this territory, they'll have to fight in court um, or else pay the like a penalty or fine for violating the um, the the art, exactly. I mean, I mean, if you're a pipeline, you could probably, you know, deal with that, but it slows things down in court, which theoretically slowing pipelines down in court, it's like buying you more time so that you can organize more. Uh, so even if it doesn't work, it buys you time to slow down. So, um, I don't think that the piece is very um, in an official court, but um, they did create like a mock trial, a UN mock trial. Um, around this uh, piece to uh, help people talk through intellectual copyright law around artworks um, and start thinking about how many other artists or kinds of installations like this could be used to slow down um, not only pipeline construction, but any kind of like uh, ecological devastation um, that is you know, planned and structured and like you would be able to kind of create a, a legal battle around. Um, I thought that was genius um, and thought provoking. Um, I'm curious to follow this work and this artist and see if there is um, ever an actual confrontation in um, a court of law. Um, this is the Bending the River piece that I was mentioning earlier. Um, and then the last uh, artist I wanna share is Carolina Caicedo. She's Colombian and she makes work across Mexico, Colombia and Brazil. Um, and this piece is called the Serpent River Book, um, which is, a collection of her work um, across all three countries and in different rivers and watersheds. Um, the result of her research is this meandering book that she has many different ways of activating. Um, so every time it gets um, exhibited, it's exhibited in, in new and interesting ways. She also hosts workshops with this book in the actual communities as a form of community building um, and uh, consciousness raising and like organizing the existing uh, activist communities doing some of the um, land rights and water rights uh, for those territories. Um, so the book is like an incredible educational tool for sustainable development and ecological preservation in these areas. A lot of these rivers were um, polluted by gold mining. So she also did uh, like what the actual contents of the book are is her anthropological research in different communities, studying how the people relate to the rivers um, and to the water. Um, I actually had the pleasure of studying with her and she was sharing at the Art and Research Center at ICA Miami, um, which if you're curious about like cutting edge contemporary art, it's a free semester with like visiting professors that they do every like fall, summer and spring. Mm -hmm. Um, and instead of it being like a whole semester long class, it's like one week each. So it's really cool. Um, you get to meet people like Carolina and um, she was sharing how she was learning the movement um, of panning for gold uh, from these communities who had to kind of learn to live with the gold mining and um, how the, the, the communities were, were losing their the, this kind of movement knowledge of panning for gold because they were being forced to work with the um, gold manufacturers and we're seeing their villages be destroyed. Um, she also has an interesting personal practice, right? So a lot of this work, um, especially when it's women artists, we're working with water, there's a lot of eco-spirituality involved um, and uh, eco-feminism. So she started to focus a lot on dams, the dams that block the rivers. And uh, one of her personal journeys was like removing her IUD because she realized that that was a, a, like an internal dam in her body. Really, really thought provoking and 
like inspiring and poetic and like spiritual um, to think about these topics. Um, and I think that this is something that we see, especially with women land artists. And I think if you noticed, all of my top five artists <laughs> are women, <laughs> um, because um, there's a bigger history of like land art and like male dominated land art mm -hmm. that is um, like very much extractive and about uh, making a mark, a, like a permanent mark on the landscape as opposed to restoring the landscape. So there's a bit of a split in the land art world in, in art history and it's it's a it has like very in, intense fissures um around along gender lines but not as much right like daniel mccormick is in there um he's wonderful and, and we're going to talk about some incredible male artists down below but just to give some context as to about this your 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 question you had a raised your hand over here mm -hmm. yes no i just said good oh yeah <laughs> yeah um so I want to spotlight some local Miami artists as well. Um, so uh, Xavier, who here has heard of Xavier Cortado? Yes, over there. Yeah. Um, I like to think of him as grandpa. <laughs> um, he is everywhere. Like it's actually hard to get away from him in Miami because he is, he's in the community meetings. He's in every like elementary school in Miami-Dade County. I, for real, <laughs> making murals about the underwater project. Um, he's in Washington, DC, like meeting with, um, with elected officials all the time. Like he is the most politically involved like artist I've ever like seen. Um, and he, his practice is very much like, how can we make art to raise awareness? So, um, uh, and, and to actually make change. So this is the reclamation project he essentially uh, was putting little mangrove saplings for people to take home with them um, and everywhere, like classrooms, botanical gardens, every library in Miami-Dade County. Yeah, you saw those. Uh huh. Um, that's why I was like, you're, you, some people here must definitely know about his work. Um, the idea is because mangroves are one of our most um, incredible tools for resilience, and especially mm -hmm. coastal resilience during storms. Um, and we're, we've decided that we do not like them aesthetically. And so along our shores in many areas, we don't no longer have um, mangroves. Um, so he, this is essentially a guerrilla art project for people to plant mangroves. Like take this mangrove, I don't know what you're gonna do with it, put it somewhere. Um, <laughs> I mean, a lot of them ended up in people's homes. The saplings are really lovely. If you ever go swimming on the beach, you might find like a mangrove, um, Actually, they're not called saplings. They're called propagules. Uh, you'll find a mangrove propagule floating to you in the ocean and you'll be like, oh, you chose me. OK, I'll take you home <laughs> to my plant garden. Um, and they grow well indoors in just cups of water. Um, yeah, so that was one project. And then the project that he's working on a lot now, and he's been working on it for years, is called The Underwater, and it's raising awareness about sea level rise. Oh, oh, interesting. Maybe a link. Yeah, I think I'm, I maybe didn't copy the link properly. And now it's not letting me. No, why can't I click into these? Did you already click the bottom? I didn't see you click the bottom. Okay. Oh, oh, there we go. Oh, I think it's just slow. There we go. Um, yeah, so the underwater, he is pretty much getting everyone to go through the underwater website here and uh, put in their uh, um, address to find their elevation so that they can see where oh, so you are relative to sea level rise. Yeah. Um, so this is, you know, Miami sea level rise by seven feet by 2100. The entirety of Miami Beach is underwater. Uh, anything that's near bodies of water, like the lake belts or the rivers will be the first to go as the water kind of seeps from underground because we live in an aquifer. Uh, sorry to describe those things so casually. <laughs> I feel like I share about this often, so it's hard to even feel it. But if you're really feeling this, right now it's um it's really powerful and that's why Sevier is doing this work and sharing it with as many people as possible because it's an invitation to think about posterity and how our choices today can 
um, impact our future? And also, how are we building resilience? You know, like, how are you preparing for the Miami of 2100 for yourself or for your children? That Miami Beach flooding is temporary. Yeah, and the storms that will come before that. Um, so something to think about and ponder is just the value of art that raises awareness. And the way that he does it is with um, just... Uh, uh, they're like uh, the kind of election signs that people put outside of their garage uh, on their gar on their garden or like backyard lawn. sign lawns yeah line lawn signage um so the, that's pretty much what they are um and so it's a way for the work to be exhibited anywhere and um Saberos often has these kinds of projects that kind of make art appear in places where you wouldn't expect it Um, another really cool artist is Lee Pivnik. He has a new project called Symbiotic House. It's a, he got a, a big grant from um, the Knight Foundation to create a multi-use space for multi-species survival, it's like an artist residency, and it will be using a lot of sustainable architecture, regenerative design. Um, right now it's in, you know, it's ideation and research phase. Um, and one of the cool things that he did was an AI visioning. So he asked various community leaders across South Florida to send an, a prompt that he would then uh, filter through mid journey and then created these um, images uh, for uh, the collective visioning of Symbiotic House. Um, he has also been creating an amazing lecture series at the Kampong. I don't know if you're familiar with the Kampong. It's like a botanical garden. Yeah, if you've been, it's so gorgeous. It's near Fairchild. Um, and it's actually the original house of, um, of David Fairchild. And uh, the talks have been fascinating. He's been bringing in incredible, incredible um, people working in sustainable architecture and uh, regeneration urban spaces. Um, another really cool artist is Lauren Shapiro. She's, her current project, so you see some of these are works in progress, like Miami right now is, on fire <laughs> with these kinds of projects. Um, I'm so excited that there's a lot of um, artists who are thinking in this way. And I think also a lot of the uh, grants and budgets are more and more prioritizing art that has ecological impact. So this Blue Horizon project um, is also an ideation stage. Lauren has created uh, like marine sculptures before. This is gonna do a community mapping exercise um, and like people are gonna be able to create pieces um, in ceramic inspired by 3D scans of coral reefs. And then it will create this kind of an arch way. Um, and it's to talk about like um, coral bleaching, which happens from uh, rising temperatures in the ocean, right? Like we have a, a huge um, ecological collapse, like that's honestly already happening, <laughs> but like in five years is like, go snorkeling now. <laughs> um, and you might still not even see um, anything other than coral bleached reefs. Um, and, uh, but she does it with a lot of community building um, activations and workshops so that she's not like making the artwork alone in a studio, but it's, there's a lot of community participation and education. And then the last one I wanna share is Jimena Camino. She, you know, is interesting. She doesn't consider herself an artist. She's more of a creative director um, because the piece is so big that it's technically not an artwork. <laughs> um, the reef line is like a park that will be built uh, a, in front of and along Miami Beach. So like on the water, maybe um, a couple miles from the coast, there will be these sculptures installed in a straight line that you could theoretically circle through or like dive through. Um, and uh, it's really exciting what it will become. They already have permits for it as well. Um, some permits are still pending. They're, they're always saying like, we're gonna start in three months and then it just keeps being pushed back because of permits. Um, but also again, the funding is incredible for this kind of scale, but it's the idea of the High Line in New York, the Underline in Miami, and now the Reef Line. Um, uh, along Miami Beach. Uh, so it's an outdoor sculpture park, an underwater sculpture park um, that will be built, um, hopefully. 
uh, for coral restoration and tourism. So um, that was a lot, um, but I hope that you are already feeling tingly about what's possible with eco art. These are, I think, some of the largest scale projects that you can imagine. Um, they're very enticing. Each one of them is like years upon years of work um, and connection making, um, of course, uh, but they are a shining possibility. Um, and I think it takes finding the right people to work with to make this kind of work happen. But obviously these artists are doing it. Um, so it's possible and, and we can do stuff like this at smaller scales. Okay, so we finished our public art branch. <laughs> um, take a deep breath. Do you have a question? Yes. Will there be time for uh, q &A? Yes, well, I know we have limited amount of time, but we also started late. Well, our class goes until 3.15. Okay. We like to take a little stretch break at some point. So. Yes, I could, I could, if I could do like 30 more minutes, it's, yeah, so like 15 minutes over. Well, I think we started late, so cool. All right, so this, this is just the raw information, right? Land art, amazing. Now we're gonna go into the world of concepts and uh, like intellectual lineage, if you will, um, of where some of these ideas and methodologies are coming from and what could be applied. So when I tell people I'm an artist, it's really hard because they expect me to be like, look at my paintings. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, I do paint and I dance and I make music and I like, I bring my watercolors everywhere. Like I play the ukulele, but I don't consider any of those things my artistic practice. I consider those things my like personal creativity. Like this is how a human being exists. But because I have all of this research, I um, think of my practice as um, more of a conceptual artist. And so oh, the things that make sense are things that fit within this like particular trajectory. And those are the things that I would put on my portfolio. Uh, which is it's like a hard to explain to people when like my portfolio is like doesn't quite look yet like what I want to be creating. <laughs> um, but I have like this like work that I've done. So um, I'm going to be sharing some key concepts that I've uh, kind of worked through through like five very long um, essays that I've written <laughs> um, about this particular practice. So um, the first essay I wrote in my junior colloquium in college. So in junior year, we had to write a very long paper. <laughs> and I decided to write, resisting gentrification, leveraging the arts to make just cities through creative placemaking and social practice art. Um, so at the time in 2016, there was a huge uh, trend towards creative placemaking and wanting to make cities more creative and artistic. Um, but there was also the tension of gentrification. Um, uh, we're gonna click through creative placemaking briefly to kind of understand this idea that um, creative placemaking is just integrating arts, culture, and design activities to generate more liveliness in a community. And it's often a term used by different organizations working together to um, do these activations in an urban space, usually with funding or a, a cross-partner collaboration. Um, and you will see them very much as like uh, community building opportunities that uh, give a, a place a sense of culture and um, and live like liveliness. Um, and these terms are, are like very much what they use, um, <laughs> right? Like culture, liveliness, vague, but they they're they're actually like value valued studied tools um, that then get used for grant making um, for creative place making projects. Um, at the time, I was reading a lot about um, cities in the creative class by Richard Florida. Full disclosure, I studied urban planning. So, so that's probably where all of this is also like my, my mental lineage is different. Like I was gonna study art history and then I was very frustrated by um, like the impotence 
<laughs> um, and also the elitism um, and the financial uh, underpinnings. <laughs> Uh, so I was like, no, I, I really want art to make a difference in the world. And so I went the route of urban planning because I could dip my toes into anthropology and sociology and bring in the arts and, and like be part of a system that could be like, we're going to make this plan so that we can change these very real things in a city. Um, and so I kind of created my own major and like my university let me get away with it. Um, but uh, the rise of the creative class um, by Richard Florida, who's actually an FIU professor, um, it talks about the, the influx of money coming from a new, a new class of person who is savvy, is upwardly mobile, um, and they, where they choose to live, um, they tend tends to kind of set the pace of where a city will develop. So he wrote this book and it was about creating cities that will attract more people from the creative class because they're tastemakers and they bring in a lot of abundance and then they support um, economic development in cities. All of this language that I just used also just disguises the fact that they're, they're also, they're like driving gentrification and gentrification is a tool for city making mm -hmm. um, and for, um, like changing um, urban neighborhoods from diverse neighborhoods mm -hmm. that low-income families can afford um, into gentrified neighborhoods. So I was thinking a lot about that problem from that lens and then learning a lot from um, Urban Alchemy by Mindy Foley Love. She was incredible. Uh, she was like a keystone of my research, um, she was talking, she created a whole framework for how to desegregate cities using arts and culture yeah. um, and bringing in joy um, into the equation with a, like a lot of social justice um, informed me methods and approaches. Um, I really recommend her work and her work ended up uh, informing mine. So elements of urban restoration is probably the, the highlights of this essay that I wrote. Um, see. So some of her ideas are keep the whole city in mind, find what you're for, unpuzzle the fractured space, make a mark, strengthen the region, unslum all neighborhoods, show solidarity with all life, create meaningful places and celebrate your accomplishments. Um, so these are her elements of urban restoration. Um, and they're all keys to how to actually do the, do the work. Um, and that's often how I would end up writing my essays from then on, was like each one of my essays is essentially like, dear future reader, if you wanted to do this work, this is how you would do it. <laughs> so they're instruction manuals. Um, uh, and when I was writing that essay, I also stumbled across social practice art, which was also really big around this time. Um, and there was a whole series of artists, especially black male artists who um, were buying up properties um, and then creating art activations around these properties in usually poor neighborhoods and combining uh, like creative placemaking. Uh, so like a library and a gallery and an artist residency with housing for, um, for young mothers uh, and for the, the artists and the young mothers would live together, which is uh, the case for Project Row Houses in Houston. Um, in, with Dorchester Projects in Chicago, Theaster Gates um, took uh, a very kind of abandoned area and the, the project was so successful. He had so many grants and turned into like three different buildings, a library, like almost an entire campus um, and artist residencies um, uh, bringing in a lot of the talent that was already existing in the neighborhood. Um, I love Mark yes, Mark Bradford. Okay, I love that there's already a familiarity with these um, artists. If you're not familiar, I highly recommend ooh, reading uh, the uh, New York Times social practice artist feature that was written in 2015. It's a great analysis of their work and, and walk through through the idea of social practice art. Um, yeah, it's, it's definitely a highlight and, and, and it's, there's so many different ways to talk about social practice. Some people talk about civically engaged art as well, or socially engaged practice. But it's all talking to the power of an artist to not just create a product in a studio, but the power of an artist to bring community together 
um, and do the kind of network alchemy of bringing people together so that they create more resilient communities. And, and it's very much related to creative placemaking. Like you can't have social practice without creative placemaking. So in the next essay that I wrote, um, artist as citizen, artist as urbanist, exercising the right to the city through urban interventions. This was my senior thesis project um, in college. Uh, so my major had a mandatory thesis. And I said, well, technically I wrote a thesis last year with this junior collection paper. Can I do um, a project? And they let, let me do that. So um, I became fascinated by um, grassroots urban planning. Um, and instead of an urban planner being like the person in the government office building behind a computer, like deciding how things are gonna go, it being like you, me and uh, your uncle, <laughs> you know, and your grandma. Um, making an intervention in something that we saw in the city that wasn't right um, and doing kind of bottom up urban planning. Um, so that specifically looked like this. Um, for me, I created um, these like chalk uh, choreographies. So I was also um, minoring in dance. So. <laughs> Um, but they were lovely. I installed these chalk choreographies at the um, intersection between Harlem and the Morningside campus. Uh, so I, I studied at Columbia University and Barnard College, Barnard being the Women's College of Columbia University. And it's, they have a like interesting history. Of course, the campus is gentrifying the Harlem neighborhood, but there's a, there are meeting points between you know what's still Harlem and what's Morningside Heights. So at those boundaries, I installed these uh, moments of play. Um, to bring people together. And um, I was applying all of these concepts about like desegregating cities, using art to bring joy and liveliness. Um, I was also inspired by happiness molecules. So I called it an urban love generator. Uh, it was really fun to go through and it itself was a kind of meditation that each dance would generate dopamine or generate serotonin or generate oxytocin. The one for oxytocin was actually a duet and you, like people would enter from different sides. Um, so it was a really cool uh, challenge to make this kind of work um, at the time, uh, but it, it was coming from uh, a lot of thinking around the right to the city so, which is an even bigger uh, like universe of thought. So the right to the city is proposing that um, people have a right to live in the cities that they live. And they right, have a right to shape the city because they live there. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a different, it's a, it's a rethinking of citizenship as not something that like citizenship is bestowed to you by a government, but rather that because you live somewhere you should have a say about it, period. Um, and not only have a say about it, but uh, be, you know, receive the benefits of living in that space. So no discrimination, fulfilled social functions, gender equality, political participation, quality public spaces, um, diverse and inclusive economies. Um, when, you know, when I show people like these like fun dance choreographies in chalk, it's like hard to think like all of these bigger concepts are um, attached, but, uh, Joy has a place in all of this, right? Quality public spaces and services, uh, desegregation and inclusivity are all very important. Um, and they were really important to me because I really valued liveliness. And so this word liveliness I learned from Jane Jacobs, who's like, if you ever take a class on urban studies or urban planning, like Jane Jacobs is like the gal. You can <laughs> Uh, her book on the death and life of great American cities was like the counter argument to um, the, what the trend was at the time in the 50s, which was to plan, out, to plan cities around car cultures mm -hmm. and create highways destroying um, black neighborhoods in order to uh, create these highways as they did um, in I-95 mm -hmm. here in, um, in uh, the Overtown neighborhood. Uh, so she was the first one to kind of 
shift that thinking um, through her book, The Death and Life of Great American Cities. And one of the great terms that she uses is like, cities need to be lively and they will actually police themselves, if you will. Like there would be less crime if you have a community where there are people on the street to watch what's happening and will like take care and support the community. Um, because a lot of the designs were at the time uh, just creating less and less um, opportunities for people to be on the street and actually like walking around the city. Um, I do have to interrupt, but I was just thinking that, you know, for the final project, you have three options, and we didn't talk a lot about some things that really overlap. So those of you who are working on the transportation um, option, this, that, that was very relevant, that we've got the work that you're just talking about, and the three of um, the highways have been, have intersected with race in most all American cities. Mm -hmm. That's really relevant. Yeah, I'm happy that the, their research intersects. Um, so the this idea of urban interventions uh, has like another layer. There's so many different kinds of urban interventions. There's so many different like landscape architects and regular architects and uh, anarchist punks, like all, <laughs> all in the world of urban interventions. I personally really enjoyed the Gorilla Art Kit by Carrie Smith. And one of the challenges during my semester was I was gonna go through everything in her Gorilla Art Kit and like create an art piece um, from her list, uh, which was really cool. I made wheat posters, I made like sound eco tours, I left post-its in uh, random urban spaces for people to find, I created scavenger hunts. Um, I really enjoyed creating small things that you can do that make you feel like you have the power to influence the people that you share space with. Um, and I really enjoyed having a toolkit or a methodology by someone who also thought along these lines of like, let's create instruction manuals. Like whatever I'm doing, I want other people to also learn how to do. Um, so I was learning from her uh, on how to do this and I highly recommend this book as well. Um, it's definitely like a, you know how we now have um, card games, like question games? Mm -hmm. This is like a, a step further. Like, let, let's not just like play question games. Like, let's do these activities together. It was super fun. Um, okay. And then uh, another thing that I was learning a lot about with urban interventions is site-specific art. Uh, who here knows this term, site-specific art? Okay. A couple folks. Um for the folks who um, who are being introduced to this term for the first time, it's making artworks that have a deep understanding of place. And so they're shaping themselves around that environment. Um, I put in here a link from the Guggenheim um, because one, the Guggenheim is a huge, you know, well-renowned art institution. They have a unique interior architecture um, that they often get artists to activate. So a lot of the installations are site-specific um, artworks, but a lot of the pieces that they highlight are indoor artworks. There's a whole world of site-specific art that is outdoor. Um, so that has to do with like where something is placed and why it's placed there relative to that wall at what specific distance. Um, but also like, you maybe you've seen murals where maybe like the Banksy murals I would think are like maybe some of the ones that people are most familiar with um where like the girl's holding up a balloon and then like a tree finishes up the balloon or something like that um so that they, they can also be these kind of visual collages um cool so that's what I learned with um the artist the citizen artist is urbanist work on right to the city and urban interventions um that was my undergrad work and uh, after I graduated undergrad, I went on like many, many amazing journeys um, that led to me working on what I'm working on right now called Healing the Future Solutions from Indigenous Spirituality, QD BIPOC Community Organizing and Promote Culture Eco-Village Regeneration. Um, but that's still a work in progress. Um, and uh, the things that did come to kind of full clarity um, in that time was the resiliency toolkit for creating community hubs in case of climate disaster. So I'm very solution oriented. Um, this is a problem. It's probably loading. 
Um, okay. Uh, I can find it this way. Um, okay, so the resiliency toolkit for creating community hubs in case of climate disaster. Um, this is a, uh, a really fun project that I worked on with Catalyst Miami. Um, Catalyst Miami is an incredible organization that does community education and resources. Um, one of their projects is the Clear Leadership Program. Um, I took the Clear Leadership Program in 2020. Um, it was virtual at the time because of the pandemic. And we had to come up with like a project at the end. Um, I ended up doing a different project, but the experience of being in this 10-week program, being educated on climate justice, inspired me to th put these puzzle pieces together to create resiliency toolkits for urban farms. So um, I did some research um, on hurricanes in South Florida and uh, put together some solutions from All We Can Save and how people survived Hurricane Maria in Puerto Rico and also that Zac Efron show on Netflix, um, Down to Earth. I don't know if you've seen it. It's full of really great solutions. Um, they had a really great episode on um, like the infrastructure that was actually available um, after Hurricane Maria that actually helped communities um, make it through um, weeks without electricity or water. Um, and uh, I'll talk more about that here um, because it was that research that I was doing with, the, with all that we can save um, and then doing my permaculture design certification at the Heartland Collective that I started to think like, how can we help urban farms um, become centers of resiliency? Because a lot of the urban farms in Miami are in low-income neighborhoods. Um, so they can become immediate centers for um, resource sharing and, mm -hmm. and neighborhood help if we just actually like give them um, uh, the opportunity to build those networks and have like solar powered um, generators and water catchment systems, et cetera. Um, I was also influenced by the work of, of Adrian Marie Brown. Um, have folks list, uh, learned about Adrian Marie Brown? No? Oh my God, so cool and exciting. She's like the most important thinker of our time. Um, <laughs> not a joke. Um, <laughs> so uh, Adrian Marie Brown has a series of books, um, all of which are absolute must reads. About four years ago, Everyone was reading this in book clubs. Um, and this book in particular is about how to find local resilience strategies with your own personal networks. She borrows from a lot of um, like ecological relationships to model and share different case studies. Um, but this is like such a powerful community building book club tool. Um, and one definitely worth reading. Another one that she wrote right after this one is Pleasure Activism, which is how to do meaningful work in the world that you actually feel good doing and how to do it in a way that feels good. Um, so that that's also a really powerful book and I recommend both. Um, and then she also has another book on cancel culture and another book about facilitating um, conflict resolution in communities, which is, you know, when you follow the path of these ideas, which is you need people to come together in order to be strong together, you end up with like all of these dynamics that you have to work through and you have to develop social intelligence, like nonviolent communication and authentic relating and conflict resolution systems and things called like that overall I would put under social permaculture, mm -hmm. which is like growing healthy communities the same way that you would grow like healthy tomatoes. <laughs> um, so yeah, this is fascinating work. Um, and in the process of work, working on this resilience toolkit, I also stumbled upon some really great frameworks. One is the design thinking framework, um, which puts the user first or like your, the people that you're serving first. So you empathize with them, you do a lot of user research, um, then you define what their problems are, you ideate a solution based on your understanding of the problem, you prototype a solution, you test it, um, and it's, the process is really iterative and you kind of go through it. What I love is that it starts with empathize um, and rather than just, you know, 
go in thinking like, I know what the solution to this community's <laughs> problems are. You actually ask people first. Um, and this is a, a thought process that I heard a lot in my studies, but it wasn't until I found the design thinking process that I was like, oh, this is the process to follow. And this design thinking process is actually how our phones get designed and our websites get designed. And the entire, our entire digital world goes through this process, um, uh, which is overall like part of UX design. Um, I also learned about permaculture design principles. So you heard me talk about perma the permaculture design course. Does anyone here know what permaculture is? Mm -hmm. One nod, okay. So permaculture is, um, it's a contemporary word for regenerative agriculture um, inspired by various indigenous practices around the world. Um, so people often think about permaculture and they think like urban gardens, healthy soil, like creating designs that help animals and plants all live together in harmony with humans. But it's much bigger than that. It's actually a design framework. Um, and these are like the 12 principles and the three core values. So you've heard of people, planet, profit. This is care for the earth, care for people and fair share. Um, and there are some really powerful ideas in here from their um, uh, design principles like self-regulate and accept feedback. So be open to modifying dysfunctional behaviors, uh, produce no waste. So create closed loop systems, um, design from pattern to detail, which is like observe natural and social patterns or things that are organically happening and then apply them to designs rather than creating designs that are not going with the organic flow of how things um, are already operating. Um, integrate, which is capitalize how things already work together so that you're not in silos. Um, use small and slow solutions. So instead of like being in a kind of tech solutionist landscape where like, what's our problem to, um, to, the grass being overgrown, it's like, okay, the, we need to have genetically engineered grass that doesn't grow. <laughs> uh, that's a very high tech solution. Uh, the low tech solution, the small and slow solution would be, well, what if we plant different kinds of plants that grow at a, only to a certain point? Or what if we have goats? eating the plants. So that's even better. There's multiple ecosystem services for that grass, right? So it's a, it's a different framework um, of how to approach things. And then the other one is use edges and value the marginal, which is important things happen at the intersections and at the edges. Um, so to always learn from what's happening at the edges um, is really a crucial value here. And uh, when you're actually designing landscapes, like the edge of your property is usually in touch with another ecosystem or another relationship um, from a, with a different landowner. So it's um, very literally important, but you can also apply these to life in many ways. Oh, we are at the 15 minute mark. Okay, can I do another 15 minutes? Let's do a break, if that's okay. Just, just to stretch. Okay, sure. You don't have to stop. But I would like everyone to stand up for their questions. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Movement snacks are important. Yeah. All right. Thank you, everyone, for listening. I hope it's been uh, no, you're us. cool. <laughs> I love that that last author was inspired by Octavia Butler. Yes. Uh -huh. yeah. All right. Yay, good. Thank you. Not to throw you off. Um, to go into the, Hello. Into the zone. Hi. Hi, full disclosure, I'm a curator and an art historian. Hello. <laughs> All right, we're back. So Ooh. I'm gonna leave this light on uh, for now, just actually then the people on the Zoom can see. Before we continue, two, uh, I just wanna say, could you have one brief response where you will write it because we we do have time for questions after, but I'd like for you to, to submit one reflection and one question. It doesn't have to be a whole big production, it can just be one sentence. Just like check 
in uh, about what your takeaways were from this today, especially because like with our last <laughs> There are people who have questions and we didn't all get to ask them. We had the generous question time, but there are sometimes lingering thoughts or things you don't feel like sharing out loud. Maybe you won't say you don't have to say anything. You can just post that on Canvas. And then also don't forget, we are going to meet at the Things Lab. I'll send you um, yeah. info about that. But that place has a lot of materials to work with. So I would like for you to think about what you propose for the clips, <laughs> and could you use the time on Thursday to work on your clips viewer? I think that would be a good use of our time at the things lab. And then if you need extra materials, they, they might have some. So would we be able to make purchases on Thursday when we go? Yes, let's plan to do that. Susan will be there, the person who runs the things lab. So think about whether you want to bring your own materials or you want to see what happens. So think about like using that time productively. Okay, I'm going to turn it over to you. Yes. And we're back. We're back. Thank you so much, uh, all of you, for paying attention. And um, I I uh, don't usually lecture. I'm actually a facilitator and often create like interactive workshops. Um, but uh, there's also a, a lot of value in like deep research. And so I hope that there's so many points of inspiration in all of this for you. Um, and uh, in an ideal world, we would have a follow-up workshop where we do interactive exercises. <laughs> um, so we're gonna continue with um, where we left off, which was around the resiliency toolkit. We were talking about the permaculture design principles. Um, we won't get into it, but you if you're curious about this route, um, Project Drawdown has uh, a comprehensive list of climate solutions. It's actually called the most comprehensive plan ever proposed to reverse global warming. <laughs> Um, it's actually really excellent. Um, and uh, as you, with, this is a long running theme. I love instruction manuals <laughs> um, and like toolkits. Um, so definitely check this out as a point of departure for many ideas to come. Um, uh, but that was, all, I, when I was creating my toolkit, I was very much drawing from solutions and project drawdown. Okay. So we're getting to the final essay in my series so far, which is where I, I landed um, on this phrase, environmental art, social practice, after my road trip across eco-communities in California. Um, and then I did a backpacking adventure through South America and I did many, many things. Um, uh, but... Uh, when I came back from those travels after experiencing um, the most stark uh, poverty I've ever experienced in my life. Um, in the northern coast of Colombia, there's a peninsula um, where the Wayu people live, and it's like a complete desert, like no man's land, zero poli like police or government presence. Um, but like people's lives there are really difficult there are some traditions on like how to live on that. Anyway, I'm getting into too into the weeds about this, but like the in, intense grief I felt um, traveling through that territory um, actually reignited my belief in this work <laughs> because I had uh, kind of like put this to the side and been like, well, you know, life is a labyrinth. That was a dead end. Um, but being in, that, in those communities, seeing... Uh, the difficulties in their life. Uh, I was really inspired by sustainable development and local efforts to transform communities. And then I remembered like um, almost like a, like a flash of fire, uh, <laughs> um, like why I had researched everything I had researched and why I valued community transformation so much. And um, I, that's where I started to connect a lot of these dots around ecological restoration and community building. 
Um, and I share this to, to kind of give some insights into the way that the path is not linear. Mm -hmm. Ideas are not always clear uh, on which threads to follow. And sometimes you think things are dead and they come back. <laughs> and then sometimes you think like uh, that things are going in one direction and they go another. Um, and, you know, it's, it, this is my, my thought web and I'm sure you could create your own um, of where your ideas will go. Um, but just keep following and trusting the process. Um, so following and trusting the process led me to write this essay, um, which we, I think of it as like my alt MFA thesis. Um, so we talked about how I haven't done a formal MFA, but I've spent like the past uh, four to six years piecing together different educational experiences um, that led me to, to talk about this. Um, and I want to share uh, one of the great uh, tactics from that process, which is participatory action research. Um, so this is a really crucial way of engaging communities, especially when the communities are different than you and that you don't always have a, a, the, ne the context necessary to, um, to make decisions for those communities. So you work with them um, in understanding the problem and co-designing and planning solutions together, mm -hmm. then observing and acting together. And then um, based on that collaboration, creating uh, systems and, communi and communication strategies for how to actually address the problem that you're engaging in. So participatory action research is like a very solid um, research methodology. It's a community building tool and it's essentially a way to like uh, if you're doing site-specific art, for example, like if I was deciding to, um, okay, so for example, with the Resiliency Toolkit project, I, I am actually working with a community um, in, uh, um, in Little Haiti. It's called uh, the Green Haven Project, and I'm working with their urban garden to create, um, uh, to, fun to create uh, resilience networks, but also to um, fund uh, resilience infrastructure like solar batteries and um, water catchment systems and all that. So I wouldn't just go into that community and be like, all right, I'm going to tell you guys what you need. I, we, I would do like a community meeting where I bring cupcakes and <laughs> I enlist them into my wild plan. <laughs> um, no, where, where I, we would do a facilitated circle where we talk about like, what are some issues that you're experiencing in your community? Like, what are some of the solutions that you're already implementing? Um, you know, here, here are some of my thoughts. What are your thoughts? What are you already working on? How can we plug in these things together? Um, how can we choose to record some of the, um, the patterns of what happens in the garden or what happens in the neighborhood mm -hmm. and then reevaluate how we wanna act um, and how we wanna execute this project? Right, so it's it's a it's a very um, community first methodology, and it's a very humble methodology, um, and I really share it again as a as a tool that you can put in your pocket as well. Is that graphic to say that you, you expand from what the core idea is based on the input you get? Mm -hmm, yeah, so you're kind of going through all four stages, and then there's these like little squiggly lines which represent conflict and confusion. <laughs> 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 I, I, that's why I picked this graphic because none of the other ones have the little squiggly lines and you're like community work is all about understanding that things get worse before they get better uh, and then you get really excited about the roller coaster um, but up, uh, but then you get really good at not, at not being a roller coaster but at being an upward spiral um, cool so then uh, we talked about land art. I, I gave you a little bit about the, the difference between traditional land art <laughs> and uh, the women of land art, um, which is there's literally like a split even in some of the like, essential textbooks for this particular niche of art. Um, and while I was doing this presentation, I discovered this book, Land Art as Climate Action, Designing the 21st Century City Park. And I was like, oh, they wrote it last year. <laughs> Um, which, you know, it feels really exciting to be like, okay, well, 
other people are putting the dots together. I'm so happy. They put the dots together. They already have a book about it. What's so interesting about this um, is that, okay, you can have land art for climate action. You can do ecological restoration. The actual city parks can um, be like carbon sinks. They can be coastal resilience infrastructure. They can be um, uh, wildlife habitat. Like they can be uh, spaces for res community resilience. They could be so many things. Um, what's interesting here is that they're very much thinking along the terms, the lines of city park. Um, and if I hadn't put that dot together until they did, um, I mean, we did have that Betsy Damon piece where she literally, you know, helped build this um, urban park in China, uh, but. You, it's you, I think there's still this idea of like land art at sculpture and um, but to say like well land art doesn't need to be curated by museums like land art belongs to botanical gardens and urban parks these are the places that are going to curate land art and land artists and eco artists um and how can that partnership the partnership be more um interwoven and intentional uh, so I would say that some of the people in my network who are working for like the Miami-Dade County Office of Resilience, both the county office and the city office, um, they are working on this. Like they are working on urban parks and they're thinking about coastal resilience and they are artists onto themselves. So I, I think it's really lovely to actually see that like reflected in the people and, um, and already in our city. Like for me, this is like a hundred percent reflection of what's already happening, um, which is really exciting. Some of those people are in our CLEAR program. So Angelo, who is um, my guest today, is also part of the CLEAR program for Catalyst Miami. Um, and I'm actually a facilitator for the program this semester, but I really, really recommend um, folks to, um, if you're interested in this work and if you're interested in climate justice, the CLEAR program at Catalyst Miami is that bridge into the environmental community in Miami, um, into meeting other people who care about these topics. And it's a free 10 week course that you take. Um, and then you create a final project at the end. And then you can apply for like a $1,500 grant to make your project a reality, which is a great way to be like, how do I dream up a project and actually make it happen? Like here's an entire infrastructure and support system um, to do it. And then that, there you go. That's your first project in your pocket. Yeah. I did mention this several times Oh, good. Well, I'm here if you have any questions about it. Um, I'm proof that it works. <laughs> That's how the Resiliency Toolkit project came to happen. It's actually being funded now, which things take forever to make, right? Like I came up with the idea in 2020. I wrote about it in 2022, and now I'm getting funding for it in 2024. Um, so things take time. What's it, what was it? Uh, clear. Catalyst Miami Clear program. You can Google that and you'll find it. Uh, and you can also ask Angela about it. Um, but yeah, our friend Carolina is taking the program as well. She works for the Office of Resilience and she's designing public parks for coastal resilience. You know, so it's, um, it's not far off. <laughs> um, <laughs> okay, I think that that finishes our, our wing over here. Um, so this is the research wing. <laughs> I hope that they have been um, thoughtful, thought-provoking insights um, for, for your practice and also maybe modeling a way that you can uh, situate your own artistic practice within an intellectual lineage. Um, in the world of contemporary art, museum art, art that gets funded by institutions, uh, institutional art, it's like a whole, it's like a whole world within the whatever, like the bigger landscape or ecosystem that is art. Um, but within institutional art, like you, the the way that you can articulate your in, your lineage, if you will, like your intellectual lineage of where your work situates, the the more str the stronger your concept is, and ultimately curators are interested in artists and artworks that have a strong concept that's relevant to a topic or theme that they want to address that's relevant to the contemporary moment because that's the curator's job. So um, as, an, as a contemporary artist, 
um, it's helpful to be able to um, articulate oneself within this kind of intellectual lineage, if that makes sense. Basically why I ask everybody to always say, why is, how is it connected to other <clears throat> artists we've been looking at? Or how, what research have we done about it? And this is something where I ask people to find links and like look at other artists. And that's why, because we, we're not alone. We, we, we've been influenced by others. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, absolutely. And, and it's that ability to work with inspiration and with concepts that mm, refines mm -hmm. our practice and our how. Um, because we can make anything, we can make everything, like the possibilities are infinite, but the things that we arrive to from a place of intuition are, are lovely, and, and but also the things that we are working on over years of like, these are my values, this is what I believe in, like, this is how people have done it right before, and this is why I want to keep doing it in that way and not this way, is like the specificity of your practice. And some things, especially when working with like things like gentrification, it's like you you actually you can't just figure that out. You have to <laughs> you have to like actively study that. Um, so uh, that's that's a lot on the research wing. I will say that this research wing uh, is probably missing another like giant research wing down here, <laughs> um, which is about. Um, my wellness focus over the past six years I've been focusing a lot around wellness and um, mm -hmm. learning from indigenous spirituality um, and permaculture regeneration all of these which are like very grassroots things these are grassroots community-based solutions and micro communities um, I was I like started to put some text together and I was like there's no way this is like almost it's tangential to this presentation but it's also like it's my soil like whatever I create like this ah, I like the idea of the roots. yeah <laughs> yeah the, there's like a, there's a whole kind of like a root system right now around this books and many others that you're not seeing but that is actually like probably my deepest <coughs> thickest root um but I'm not but I'm not like it, it some of it is so um not in the realm of books um or at least I haven't explored it through intellectual pa um study that it's like hard to even put it on this space. So that's why I'm working on an essay around it. Um, I heard the body thesis for it, but there's a theory. Yeah, it's often, it's, about, it's around the idea of embodiment and like how our bodies are, are a whole part of ourselves um, and our spirituality uh, and our sense of well-being are, are connected to the way that our body remembers certain um, experiences and traumas. Um, it's an expanded understanding of the self beyond just the mind, which I think we often in the West mm -hmm. um, isolate knowledge as something that can come exclusively from the mind and from rational experience. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, okay, so now we arrive at um, my personal projects and I, I don't think that I wanna to take too long here because I really wanna leave room for questions, um, but uh, I think we've kind of covered a little bit that my practice um, does involve creating objects, but because I have this kind of bigger conceptual framework, the objects that I create aren't always in relationship to my conceptual framework. And that's okay. Like we can have different avenues for expression. Um, and I highly live by multidisciplinary experimentation, like the idea of jumping from one discipline or genre to another in a kind of creative spiral. Some people might call it ADD. Um, <laughs> um, but I just think it's cool to like learn to play drums and then apply the thinking of playing drums to making a painting mm -hmm. and then apply the experience of making a painting to writing a song and write a song inspired by poems that I'm reading. Um, <laughs> And the poem inspired by like an outfit. Yes, and then the outfit inspired by birds uh, <laughs> from my travels. Um, so I think that that is more like following the thread of creativity and inspiration in which we all experience, but we live in a society that says like, you're a painter, you must only paint. <laughs> um, 
and then yeah this the idea of like a form versus function like you know are, are you creating an art piece that's for you so you create are you experiencing art as a mindfulness activity or are you trying to you know get into a certain grad school mfa program or have a certain collector by your work like those are real considerations around art practice that I have not um uh like yet taken seriously as like an uh, like an artist that produces objects because I've been in the world of experiences and this is what we'll talk about is that I am an, a, a conceptual artist and this is like you I think this intellectual stuff that I just shared with you is like what makes me a conceptual artist um, but in the world, I mostly move as a facilitator and not an artist. Um, and facilitation is more about community dynamics and interactions um, and creating like collective spaces for education, which is why it's a little bit funny that I'm giving a lecture <laughs> and not a workshop um, because I mostly give workshops and retreats. I create workshops and retreats and that's how my um, artistic practice evolved organically um, was I started to create this rites of passage series um, which I have since labeled human connection workshops um, to uh, maybe seem less woo-woo to people uh, <laughs> but they started from very like mystical places so Moonrite's Cradle um, was the first workshop I did. We, it was a, a full moon bonfire on the beach that I timed specifically to the moonrise. Um, so as we were like sharing stories and songs around the fire and, and drinking cacao and honey and tea um, around this like beautiful altar with like rainbow fire, the, the moon would be rising. Yes. I have a question. Yes. Where can you do a bonfire? Oh, I mean, they used to do it the, where they did the 79th Street drum circle. Yeah. Uh, times have changed maybe when I did this, but also like if you're, um, yeah, I don't know, I got away with it. <laughs> <laughs> No, I just, I just brought a, I just brought a metal plate. I, I brought a metal plate to the. Not everyone uses a metal plate. I, I brought a metal plate. Um, and then we used wood, and then lit the fire. <laughs> we use lighter fluid. I mean, the, the wind is not always the easiest for making a fire, and we created a pit. Um, uh, the you know another piece that I made is I made a seven circuit seed labyrinth. So I got really into labyrinths as a tool for understanding the path and. Um, and then I built like a 25 foot by 25 foot labyrinth that I then hosted a ceremony in um, as the sun went down again on the beach and like brought lots of you would have come along into this like shamanic journey meditation inside of a labyrinth. <laughs> I don't know how to make sense of this with like, you know, the rest of the, like the conceptual work that I just shared with you, but it's like, this is this in a very core way has been my art practice. Um, and they're not like, I don't know if these things are art. They're workshops, but they're art. They're like performance installation. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> uh, the Rooted Heart um, workshop series, I, I, I went to Costa Rica and I made my own cacao with like a Cuban, the, the daughter of a Cuban revolutionary. Um, and cacao is like a sacred uh, plant from Central America. Uh, that's used in for ceremonial purposes it's also a heart opener it's a like it's chocolate but like it's hot chocolate before it gets processed and it has these like beautiful euphoric qualities and strong human connection uh, abilities the same way like coffee makes you talk more like cacao makes you feel more um and so we did this beautiful cacao ceremony um reading our hearts into our ancestry and talking about like uh, the, the traumas we've inherited, the gifts we've inherited um, from our lineage. And we drew our family trees and so much. <laughs> I have them, I have like full, like uh, 
archive of, of like all of the outlines of the facilitated exercises that we do from all of these as well, because ar archiving and documenting your work is essential. And when your work is like facilitating workshops, like the actual workshops that you, like the activities that you do become like your elements. Um, so that has been fun. Um, and then since then I've created many others. Um, and usually I would take a class and then create a piece. This one, Integrity Planting. Um, I took an herbalism course and then um, created uh, like a workshop where we drank different teas based on the emotions that we wanted to work through. And then we planted seeds of integrity. I was like, what, what, you know, how, what are our values? What do we stand for? And what are we gonna keep growing in our lives? Everyone here has like become like an epic human, by the way, in Miami, <laughs> um, which I'm really grateful to, to attract. But this is like our early years. Um, women's circles, uh, like so many like uh, death cafes and grief circles working with them. Joanna Macy's work that reconnects. Joanna Macy is an incredible she honestly should be in the research piece, um, incredible facilitator who would create these vast social rituals for people to process their emotions um, together in their bodies as a community. And all of it was related to like the shifts that are happening in our culture and in our environment. It's like very, very powerful work, the work that reconnects. Oh, I linked to their Instagram. Um, yeah, they have a lot of things. Highly recommend also like one of the most important. Um, okay. Uh, I created an Earth Week retreat again with this like uh, regenerative climate intention and I was doing uh, lots of workshops for it. Um, and I did that across five different cities in Ecuador in partnership with the Selena Hotels. I did that while I was backpacking. And um, then I created a, not then, these are not in chronological order. I also created a, a nature therapy uh, experience in the Everglades that I hosted a couple times. Now I'm working on a coral restoration community, um, very much related to the Reef Line project. And I think that that's where the future of my work is gonna go. I'm like, I've been giving talks on coral technology and underwater sculptures. Um, so that is where, you know, some of the things I've done. And then I have like one-on-one -on -one creative play projects. One started out as a podcast, which is informed by, um, uh, okay, when people don't have access to the internet, they use hard drives, like, like USB sticks or like memory drives. Um, so there was a, when I was traveling, there was a particular hard drive that I came across that was a nomadic library that someone had collected from various permaculture communities across the African continent. Um, so they were a collection of digital books um, and that were related to regenerating the earth from across different eco-villages mm -hmm. in Africa. And I was like, this is a treasure. Mm -hmm. So I went in the middle of the jungle of Costa Rica and like bought a hard drive, <laughs> which you can do because lots of photographers pass through there. So they need giant hard drives. Um, and uh, I made a copy of it. And then I started a podcast talking with my friends um, about it uh, and like researching into the texts that were in there. The conversations we ended up having are pretty cool. Um, the titles I had a lot of fun with. Um, so that was like a way for me to have a connection with other people. So I think human connection is really crucial to my practice. And then what I've done, been doing now and probably most people know me as so this is like the funny thing is like what you become known as versus like who you think you are on the inside. <laughs> who I think I am on the inside is a conceptual artist who most people know me as is like a poet. Um, and I do these like cute TM poetry pop-ups where I write poetry together with people. And it's usually the way I make friends. Um, and then I, you, you heard about my resiliency toolkit project a couple of times. I would say that in terms of like what this conceptual practice that I've shared today, the nature therapy in the Everglades, the Coral Friends community and the resiliency toolkit for urban farms are all part of like this portfolio around environmental arts social practice. Um, and making this presentation, thank you for, for inviting me to share it, um, was our an opportunity for me to evaluate my artistic practice and uh, take advantage of some of my own 
um, instruction manuals because <laughs> I've already written the steps on how to do this work. And um, so just to like actually apply it um, because the point of the work is not creating a sellable product. It's about community coming together to co-create a last, uh, beautiful lasting solution in the landscape, um, which I, that's definitely, you know, my intention, um, but creating a sellable product, maybe sellable can be a different, a different, we can, we can, we, we can rethink what sellable is. Um, and I want to leave you with this amazing resource. So I'm always about action and resources. So you're super welcome to go through my website, yadirakapaz.com and on the homepage, you'll see a link to the impact plug. This is a list of community resources related to um, ecological initiatives in South Florida. Uh, so whether it's a sustainability guide by an eco artist or um, fun conscious events, my one of the facilitation communities that I um, helped create um, or like direct action, uh, ways to get involved, volunteer, fellowships, the CLEAR program is on this list. Um, you can join groups like Swamp Friends, which is a super, super active community um, full of environmentalists mm -hmm. uh, who go on hikes and to talk about politics. Um, or, yeah, there's like lots of amazing resources in here and also funding resources for projects. Um, so yeah, that's, um, I, that's definitely something that you can explore on your own and see. But uh, I think with that resource and also with the reminder that you can make the most of inspiration by just analyzing an artist's structural logic and then just applying it to your own site specific problem. And then you have your own work of art and it's not called copying, it's called inspiration. <laughs> um, especially because when you're talking about site specific problems, you always have to like readjust and um, shift. So it's never the same anyway. But I hope that this has been useful to you. I hope um, that you have received something from this and I can open the space for questions. Thank you so much. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> that was a lot. <laughs> yeah, I have it. Maybe if you want to repeat the question for the um, recording, like it's like this question. Sure, yes, I'll repeat the question for the recording. Yeah. Uh, this was just a random question to see if you knew, but it was how do you even stop water levels from rising? Or how does how does that even that's a great question. <laughs> Let's make a workshop. <laughs> so the question is, how do you stop water levels from rising? Okay. Do you want me to answer? <laughs> okay, I'm, I, I, can give a, I, mean, I can give an informed scientific answer. Um, okay, so the, level, the water levels are rising because um, we are warming up the earth through an excess of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. The majority of pollution for greenhouse gases comes from fossil fuel um, pollution. Uh, so your cars, airplanes, industrial production um, are all kind of um, creating a thick blanket around our atmosphere, which traps heat in. That heat that gets trapped um, interacts with our very complex <clears throat> dynamic weather systems. And that means that in the North and South Poles in particular, uh, as the temperature rises, because the whole um, average temperature of the earth is, is getting warmer, even though individual pockets might be at different temperatures. Um, that those temperature shifts mean that like winters are, are less cold and less long. So the glaciers start to melt. So there's literally like frozen water is melting. Mm -hmm. That's why we have rising sea levels, but also the ocean is expanding because water is a molecule. And when, you, when the temperature of water is warmer, the space between the molecules is bigger. So the literal material of water is taking up more space when it's warmer and there's more water that's melting. Not only from glaciers, but also like the runoff from mountains that again, less cold winters, uh, the, the water doesn't freeze again. So there's lots of water entering from rivers back into the ocean and never kind of like solidifying at the top of the mountain again. Yeah. Isn't it weird that there's a paradox between the freezing and the melting of things? Like 
you would think that the sun is heating up something, wouldn't it just evaporate into rain if it's hot? Mm -hmm. But then when it gets hot, it expands, right? Mm -hmm. And then when it freezes, it contracts. But it's like, how, how, like, maybe the sea level rising is a thing that was already going to happen in the earth, regardless of, you know what I mean? Yeah, I wouldn't hold space for the complexity of this science. Um, <laughs> and uh, it's okay to like not know like um, the specifics of why these weather systems work the way that they do. Uh, however, like the abundance of scientific evidence uh, shows that there is like an exponential shift in um, our weather patterns. So instead of it being like, you know, that we have seasons, right? Like it gets hot, it gets cold, it gets hot, it gets cold. But it's um, the CO2 levels in our atmosphere correlate with the, um, huh? With the, industrial with the industrial revolution. Yeah. <laughs> and especially the past like 30 years um, where like globally we have industrialized, not just like England and the United States industrialized, but like China and India and like several developing countries. Um, so that, um, is a huge exponential shift that is throwing off a lot of different systems. And we're already living in some of those systems that are being thrown off. Like when spring used to be, as, or when spring used to start, it's not starting at the same time. Or like now we have storms in certain parts of, um, of the world that didn't, that didn't used to go in those directions. Like now we have a lot of hurricanes going up along the East Coast. We didn't used to have that. Um, so those, yes, but there are actual graphs. Like I, you can come to the clear program with me. We saw the data in Charles Gaines' installation. Oh, good. Yeah. He, he mapped, remember on the video, he mapped the, the time passing. That's the pattern also showing the intensity of the storm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and he didn't give us a bibliography. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but there's some um, uh, really great documentaries on this. Um, I think the one that most people know about is the Al Gore documentary, An Inconvenient Truth. Um, maybe this is before your time. Um, but uh, in 2000, uh, we had a decision as a country. <laughs> We, cho we, we chose Bush instead of Al Gore. Oh. Uh, and, but Al Gore's like entire message after that presidential election shift became um, raising awareness around climate change. Okay. Mm -hmm. Disputed whether we did choose Al Gore. Yeah, very much Bush disputed. Before very much. Al Gore, but Florida was involved and voter, voter, voters' um, ballots were in question. So. Mm. And in lakes and rivers and streams and mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah, so the complicated uh, timeline uh, there, yes. So like, what's the average schedule for you to like do all these things? Because like, none of it sounds exactly the same, even though they're similar or like similar pockets. <laughs> Listen, I also ask myself that question. Um, <laughs> but what do you mean specifically? Like, when do I work on all these things? <laughs> Well, yeah, because like you got poetry on one, and you talk about <laughs> coral reefs on another, and you lead in workshops, you lead in trainings, and I'm like, hey, yo, like, who are you? Because <laughs> like, like Akon at least had a twin. Like, like, <laughs> yes, um, I haven't had a full time job in three years, so that helps. Uh, so much this I working on. <laughs> yeah yeah i mean but i micro jobs so instead of like thinking of life as like full-time job that you're working 40 plus hours a weekend or a part-time job where you're working 25 hours a weekend like i do micro jobs that are seasonal mm -hmm. so i'll work on something for three months 20 hours a week and then i'll to do also work at another thing and uh while also doing another thing um and it all adds up to me doing all of these things <laughs> 
I don't watch TV and have, I stopped watching TV when I was like 16. I don't know. <laughs> not as like, not to promote it. I think I should watch TV. I have a right <laughs> to relax. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> but I think I made a choice to like um, prioritize in-person experiences and communication and like, um, yeah. And I think that has spiraled into these multi multifaceted practices. Um, and a lot of the things that I do are in collaboration as well. Like since the pandemic, I was like, all my work is a collaboration mm. or I'm working in contracts with others. Um, so that makes things strong. I will say that I like all of these projects are, are nice, um, but I could have and will have bigger projects now that I'm learning to build things in collaboration. Mm -hmm. Because if I don't have like the resiliency toolkit, for example, which is like one of my bigger projects, if I didn't have Catalyst Miami, like supporting me to create, to, to even come up with the idea, right. then to win a, like a sponsorship to do the permaculture design course, um, then getting the Neighbors to Leaders Fellowship to actually fund me doing this thing, it wouldn't exist, you know? It's, it's still also technically, you know, it's like an idea right now. It's, it's currently in this execution phase. The uh, Coral Friends Community Project um, I came up with that because I, um, was chosen to create a retreat around ocean conservation last summer, uh, as a, as like a, as a gig. It was a, it was like one of the fanciest gigs I've ever had. Like I was with like surfing champions and coral scientists working with Adidas. It was cool. Um, it inspired me a lot. And then I created the Coral Friends, um, community here. Um, I, I, it was like a month long activation of six different events that I pretty much pulled off like from one month to the next. Um, it, it was like, some things were really well attended. Some things were not like had lots, like 11 people showed up to um, like a, a panel, you know, or like five people came with me to the keys, like um, 20 people showed up for a peach cleanup. But uh, you know, other things were like, you know, the climate grief circle was like four people on a climate doom spiral <laughs> um but <laughs> but uh <laughs> the uh this but uh but doing that like doing this project which I would say was like small scale and like I like felt divine inspiration like I was in a coffee shop listening to a really amazing playlist drinking like coffee and chocolate and creme brulee <laughs> And I just like downloaded this idea of coral friends and like fall for the oceans and that these, uh, this event series <laughs> needed to happen. And me doing that event series led to me being chosen as an Aspen Future Leaders, which is like an amazing uh, opportunity to network with like top people in climate action. It's the Aspen Climate Ideas Conference. It happened a couple of weeks ago. But because I did that project, you know, I was able, and because I've done all the other stuff, I was part of the like ocean, the, the, their ocean club <laughs> and ended up leading a talk on coral technology. And then I won a grant to do, to uh, like now I'm getting certified in scuba diving with the support of the Hispanic Access Foundation that is now like getting more Latinx people to get certified in scuba diving because they want more of us in like marine conservation and co uh, coral tech. <clears throat> So um, all I can tell you is like, if you have a project, like make your project happen because then the next, the next step will appear. And often people won't like give you an opportunity until they see you already doing the work. Right. And then you apply for something to like help make it bigger. Wow. Yeah. In your personal practice, because uh, the doom spiral is real, mm -hmm. not just as a feeling, but as a, like it's, there's really booming mm -hmm. things that are happening. What's your practice in, I don't want to say staying hopeful, but staying engaged in a way that is relevant and, and keeps you from saying, you know, no, we don't need it. This shit is gone in a hundred years. Why would we save it? You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Positive. Yeah. Like, yeah. I don't know if it's even positive. I don't want to call it something because I don't know what that might be for you. That's, I'm curious of what, what it is. Well, I, I created Coral Friends because I, um, I was seeing a presentation at that uh, ocean conference that I helped organize um, and like my third eye started bleeding like I don't know I don't know like maybe there was like a mosquito who bit me you know but by the end of that presentation I was just so like um, 
in shock and in grief of like the coral bleaching that had happened in the Keys last summer. Um, and then I went to the bathroom and I was like, there's literally blood coming th from here. Uh, so that was like a mystical <laughs> experience. <laughs> um, and I needed to do something about it. So I, I did what I could, which my skill set is like, I love creating events and workshops and retreats. This is actually what I do for money um, and what I can do for an art practice. And, uh, you know, it's not like the most successful project ever. I haven't built like a 10,000 person online community, which there are people who do that and they're, that their social media skill is like on point. But it's been enough for me to, to be on the path and be along with a bigger community that's working on this. Um, and it's, yeah, so I always do something about things. Um, and I don't think I'm solving the problem, but I would rather be part of the team who is trying. And also something I'm personally questioning is like, okay, cool. I'm like, I'm trying to save the world all the time. Um, what about the fact that I'm a, like, I'm a Latina, first generation immigrant. Like my family comes from super humble roots. Like financially, you know, this stuff is like, you know, stars in the sky. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> so, you know, like I do have responsibilities as like a person um, that I have to engage and negotiate. And, but what I found is that people who want to solve problems and who have the same values that I do are also in resilience networks. So what's that saying? It's not about how big the house is. It's about how happy the people in the house are. Mm. <laughs> I think that's a good um, sentiment to wrap up. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, please, please li have fun with the links. Yes, yes. Guys, Angelo has requested a photo. Oh, yeah, can we have a photo? I'd love a photo. I do. So let's do it. How should we do it? Um, uh, birthday party style in front of the presentation. Okay. <laughs> oh my God, please everyone hold the cupcakes. <laughs> we can just go into full, full screen.
you on Thursday. Look for my message. As, as, as always. Oh, I'm on Instagram also. Like, I don't know. <laughs> Yes. Yes. Let me see what it is. Hold on. What is this phone? Is there no yeah. 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 iPhone 12 mini. Oh, can we stop this? Oh, okay. Let me. Yeah, my Instagram is flux capacitor. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> yeah.